Welcome to Coping with Life, the show where we take a look into three unique stories on how people just like you and I cope with their mental health struggles through a creative outlet. I'm your host, Rachel Saffer, and with me today is my co-host, Dr. Jennifer Smith, the clinical supervisor at NAMI Southeast Wisconsin. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Rachel. Pleasure to be here. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background in counseling? Certainly. Um, I received my doctorate in clinical psychology from the Wisconsin School of Professional Psychology in 2017. I have been working as a psychotherapist since about 2009. I've worked with individuals with substance use disorders for a really long time um, when I first started doing treatment. And now I'm working in a clinic where I see more individuals with um, mental health diagnoses, depression, anxiety, PTSD, bipolar disorder, those kind of diagnoses. Well, it's great to have you here. We will be talking more in a bit, but first let's follow along as singer, songwriter, and Iraqi veteran Jesse Freeward shares his story on how he copes with his mental health struggles through the art of music. To cope, I really rely on my music most, most heavily. Um, there, there are other things, but like uh, music is a way for me just to express myself sometimes when there isn't words, um, just to kind of play and kind of get the mindfulness of putting yourself into something, something else, you know. I'd say what got me into music as a creative outlet was both a means of self-expression and also just a way to cope with some of the issues I was dealing with. I would say music helps me most by just maybe like getting out, outside of my head um, you know, you can kind of just get lost in your thoughts sometimes and just um, music kind of is a way just to kind of take myself out of that and put it into something else, something expressive. I would say I feel when I'm playing music or playing guitar, hmm, it's really hard to say. Uh, I would say like I feel just alive like it, it's something I am passionate about I you know everyone wants to be able to express themselves in some way and like this is my venue of doing that telling usually personal stories but sometimes um, just you know just something you want to get off your chest in a song and expressing it in a condensed kind of format such as songwriting so yeah it's it's giving me purpose, it's a passion. Um, it's kind of a new mission in a way, so. Yeah, I would say the advice that I would give to anyone that's struggling maybe with PTSD or bipolar disorder, it's definitely, while music is really important to express yourself, but always feel free to reach out there, like if you really need it. Um, isolating isn't gonna improve the problem. Like. So reaching out would be one, and then also just kind of, you know, getting out outside of your head, doing doing something mindful, like like music, for instance. I mean, it doesn't have to be if you love chess, if you love art, um, just whatever your hobby is. Like if you can just take yourself out of those kind of circling thoughts or just the angerness of a situation or whatever, like the symptoms might be. Um, and just put it into something else. Like also, the, the, there's a really big importance to anyone that's like struggling is get connected with like some kind of group too. I think that would be most beneficial. Um, like groups like Guitars for Vets or you know, just maybe if you like working out and just getting in kind of a community in that way, just CrossFit, wh whatever it is you're into, MMA. Um, Get, get plugged in, don't, don't isolate. Thank you, Jesse, for showing us the power of music therapy. 
Music can be an amazing escape or just a way to share your feelings through a different form. Now, Dr. Smith, can you give us a medical definition of what PTSD and bipolar diagnoses are? Certainly, Rachel. PTSD, or post-traumatic stress disorder, um, can be a set of symptoms that result from experiencing a trauma. And right now, we define a trauma as um, death or threatened death, um, actual or threatened physical assault, actual or threatened sexual assault. Mm -hmm. And um, when we talk about witnessing or experiencing this, it's, it's actually experiencing it, having it happen to you, witnessing it. Um, learning about it happening to somebody else or being threatened to somebody else, like a loved one or close friend, um, or hearing about um, these situations as like a first responder does, so even therapists. Um, with bipolar disorder, it is <clears throat> an individual has to have experienced a manic episode or a hypomanic episode to have that diagnosis. And those are defined by time frames of pretty serious symptoms or requiring hospitalization. Um, for the, both those diagnoses, reaching out to supports, reaching out to professionals is, is often the most helpful in treating those diagnoses, not isolating, not being alone, as Jesse mentioned, um, getting connected with support groups and um, finding support for each other. Mm -hmm. Thank you for clarifying those diagnoses. A lot of people may not have known that. Speaking of things that many people may not be aware of, Depression can be a lifelong battle, but that doesn't mean you can't be okay. Michelle Embertson shares her story on how she manages the war going on inside of her mind through the form of visual art. I recall being eight years old and being depressed. Um, so definitely depression, anxiety. Um, of course, they usually go hand in hand and they really do in me and um, I suffer from ADD. Uh, didn't know that until after I uh, graduated high school <laughs> and I'm like that answers a lot of questions and that contributes to a lot of depression. Um, the positive coping things <laughs> is definitely my art. Um, I, I've always liked to, to do uh, different art stuff, um, even even as a child. Uh, I went to school though for, uh, I went to art school for um, video and photography, but uh, lately I pretty much do uh, my watercolors. I've done acrylics, I've even sold a few of those. I've done some multimedia type um, canvases like uh, uh, steampunk theme, you know, those are really cool. Currently, it's mostly just um, my watercolors, and I I have to push myself sometimes to do it. Um, and that's one reason I, I like to keep some of my supplies right out in front of me, because if I see it, then I'm like, you know, you should go over there and you should start painting you'll feel better. And it's took me many years to actually get to that point. You have to start to learn to know yourself and that really helps with, with learning to cope. Um, and it's, it's, it's very much a relief once you do because you can help yourself. Um, a lot of times, especially when you're younger and stuff, I know for me, I, just would self-medicate or, or things that wouldn't be positive. But my artwork is definitely positive. Um, of course, as an artist, it's hard to like your own stuff, but uh, occasionally I do. <laughs> so that makes me feel really good. You know, it's just, it's just how my mind works. Uh, I, have, I have that artist sort of mind and and I see it in my head and I try to put it out on paper. It does not often come out the way I see it in my head, but who cares? It's the process, uh, it's not the product. So and that took me a little bit to learn. <laughs> but, you know, learning that, learning yourself, um, how, you, how you deal with things, how, 
how you don't deal with things. It's a lot of self-talk. And that's what I do. Um, I do a lot of self-talk as I'm, I'm, I'm doing my painting and all my artwork to let myself know that you're okay. Um, this depression or this anxiety is not going to be here forever. Uh, you will come out of the, the slump that you're in. Um, it's been many years for me to realize that I can tell myself that and believe it. And because uh, at the point when you're very, very low, um, you you don't see you don't see anything to cope with uh, that will help you cope. You don't see anything that's going to help. You just see where you are. You see right in front of your face, and you don't see the the future. Uh, you see the bad past or the bad present, and if you don't do the self talk that's positive and you get to know who you are and how you function, um, it is so much more helpful. And I think that by doing, creating the things that I do, um, it helps that. It helps me focus because I do have ADD and uh, focusing is <laughs> not the easiest thing to do for me, but to put paper in front of me and some paint. I can focus on that and I can and focus on the things that are positive instead of um, sitting and, and saying things in my head that aren't true. Um, just, you know, I, I can't, I can't stress enough about learning yourself, learn who you are. And, and by me saying that, I mean, um, go, when I go through an experience like I'm going through, what is it that I do? What are my, what are the things that I do? If you need to, write it down. And next time you go through that, you'll know that this is coming. I'm going to feel like this. And the last time I felt like this, I got through it. And you, you start to learn yourself. The older you get, you do. Um, I wish that I had learned that way before I did, but you know, everybody has their, their time. It's great to see the unique ways in which Michelle learned to cope with her diagnosis in lieu of self-medicating. Dr. Smith, would you be able to describe to us why visual art could be a beneficial coping method? Certainly, Rachel. Visual art, um, you know, it, it's kind of like journaling. It's, diff it's using a different style to put your feelings on paper. Um, kind of like Jesse in the first video, music, the same thing. Mm -hmm. He wrote lyrics or poems and put it to music. Um, Michelle is taking pictures and um, documenting feelings through colors and pictures. And so I look at those kind of um, coping skills, music and drawing and visual arts as being grounding skills or journaling. Um, mm -hmm. opportunities. Grounding skills are those that keep us in the moment, keep us in the present moment, focused on what's happening right in front of us instead of thinking about the past or worrying about the future. Um, just kind of focusing on what we have control of right in front of ourselves. You know, Michelle also um, mentioned, you know, hobbies, how important hobbies can be as coping skills to us, have mm -hmm. us feel um, like we have some purpose or value in our life, something for us to focus on, something we can learn from, grow from, be proud of, um, and also something that can challenge us to um, look at ourselves from different perspectives and see our growth along the way. Um, and so, you know, documenting our growth through the visual art can also be um, something that's very helpful too. Also helps when we're experiencing mental health struggles to, to look back and, and be able to see the documentation of how maybe we were mm. experiencing it in the past and came yes. through it and how our art changed through that. Mm, yeah. um, and so it can just be very empowering to help us see our growth along, along the way. 
It's like a, a historical record of your emotions, and you can see the growth that Absolutely. like organically happened. Absolutely, that's Absolutely. a really unique way of looking at that. Yeah, and yeah. she also talked about how um, she saw herself grow and change through her process. So yeah, yeah. It may be hard to find something you're passionate about, but there is some, something for everyone when it comes to a hobby. Gabriel Eret tells us how he has found his passion and how he uses it to help others. I feel like I've struggled with uh, anxiety and depression, and uh, you know maybe I've heard some stuff like I don't know. I just kind of have things in my head and like be a little bit louder than others, never been diagnosed, but you know, I've talked to plenty of people that have gone through some stuff and I feel like, you know, I'm dealing with it in my own way. Mostly just distracting myself. I used to exercise a lot as a kid and that would help, but uh, I've, since I've kind of calmed down and I don't really got all that energy anymore, I kind of just, you know, do art because uh, it really like kind of calms me down. It's, it's, it's soothing to do. Same thing with music and you know when you get to share it with people you get to see the smile on their face and you get to see like them enjoy something just as much as they would have enjoyed a song on the radio and like hey dude this stuff is cool like you get to see them kind of talk to your other friends about it and I don't know it's, it kind of gives like a little uh, it kind of gives a little confidence boost knowing that you put something out there that people actually you know want to enjoy. Like when I was a kid, I used to play on the PlayStation and my DS a lot. And you know, when things were happening at home and whatnot, or even in like stressful car rides or whatnot, uh, I used to just play on my DS or play on my PS1 and kind of escape to those realities. And you know, when you go and you play those games for a while, and uh, you kind of get attached to the characters. So when you're at school or something and you don't really have any friends, you kind of like associate those with friends. You kind of see that in younger kids too, like. They're like, oh, Mario's my friend, oh, Sonic's my friend, and they draw them all the time and do stuff like that. And I was one of those kids, like I did that with Crash, Spyro, Mega Man, and that's where I get a lot of my art influence from. But I always wanted to make those characters that, you know, people could escape to or like those hub areas or levels because even though they're just kind of like simple graphics, you just kind of get that feeling of like being at home when you've played it for so long and that was kind of your escape. It kind of gives people like, some semblance of home and I kind of want to give that to other kids where they're able to have like their own imaginary friends, have dreams where they go into worlds with them and you know, explore stuff and just <laughs> put themselves not here. <laughs> so usually a lot of my ideas just come with, honestly they come from a lot of like stressful dreams like nightmares. Uh, I have my nightmares, usually, usually they get pretty bad with Sometimes family members, loved ones are included, but then I try to take that environment that I'm put in because I don't just have like a nightmare like, oh, somebody's chasing me down the street. No, I have a nightmare like all of my family members are put in like hydraulic press tubes and there's a timer going off before they die and there's these weird blue metal like things or there's ceiling lights that are like really bright and there's emergency lights or there would be like this weird demon amalgamation creature that's chasing me down like space corridors or like some like that fourth dimensional like AI art that you see like some of that's why I'm so interested in it because a lot of that stuff is like the weird dreams I have and you and uh, those are kind of like it's kind of like a melancholy escape because while I'm going through it it's a nightmare but then when I wake up it's like wow that was a really cool like area I know all the bad shit happened but you know your mind's got to like push that out somehow and I kind of just take those bad ideas or bad um, scenarios, I should say, and turn them into a cool environment. Like, I mean, a lot of uh, like a lot of the evil bases and stuff in my games, like all the metal stuff, all the like enemy designs. A lot, it's kind of like Kirby, where they've got some creepy designs in it because those are like the stuff that comes out of like my nightmares, and I try to include that in like the kid-friendly universe, but like dumb it down to where it's not like, oh, you get to see all the gore. <laughs> Just kind of, you know putting stuff in there with and working with uh, trying to make the nightmares not hurt as bad and also to bring something positive out of it instead of just kind of like sitting on that nightmare and being like damn if that happened in real life that would be horrible like yeah it would but then when I get when I get my mind past that and I wake up I'm like it was just a dream and 
I can make something cool out of it. You gotta take the best out of the worst. Uh, well, the one thing is, is definitely, if you don't have a hobby, get one. Like, uh, it's de it definitely helps a lot, you know. Um, with drawing, I, I, got, I watched this seminar and I watch a lot of podcasts and stuff. And there was this one guy that pulled out a notebook and he was like, I write an idea down every day in this notebook, no matter what. And I've always stuck with that to the point where I carry around a little pocket notebook and when I get stressed or when I just want to distract myself, I just write down the idea. And I don't think there's a single day where I don't come up with something new or I don't work on something. Just having that like, you know, that hobby booklet of either ideas of stuff that you can do when you get home or um, just what stuff you want to get down or just like think, I don't know, just like any creative stuff you want to get off your head, it really helps like writing stuff down. Kind of like when you go, like when you're, when you're taking notes for a class or when you're about to go to sleep and you write down what you want to dream about or you write down your actual like uh, flashcard notes, writing it down helps to like, you know, kind of like keep yourself in the memory of that and keep that in the back of your head and keep your mind on it. Actually, for some reason that physical motion does a lot. It is really empowering to see how he uses his nightmares to his advantage as a creative inspiration. Now, Dr. Smith, why would this form of coping be beneficial? Well, as Gabriel talked, he is really um, taking control back and power back from the nightmares he's having and by using those characters in, mm. in this game. You know, it's really having those those experiences in his nightmare to not be as strong and help him kind of work through them not being real experiences. You know, he also talked about how making these video games is, you know, can give back to other individuals and that can show um, how, you know, this kind of media can help um, you cope and, and just kind of passing that along to other people. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, and as I mentioned um, before, it's another type of journaling, right? He's journaling his experience through his nightmares and taking that control back, that power back, but also um, he can also influence his dreams, his nightmares through that experience as well. Um, and so that can be a very beneficial um, coping skill for something like anxiety or depression. Um, as can um, other coping skills like relaxation coping skills, which a lot of individuals who are in um, that kind of, who do that kind of um, video game production, find that a very relaxing kind of experience for them as they, you know, are in touch with the characters that they're making and um, the graphics that they're using. Again, we bring in some grounding skills in that it helps them focusing on different ses senses and, and being present in that moment versus thinking about um, whatever their brain is making them think about. Um, you know, Gabriel also mentioned recognizing his coping skills stopped working his, when he was younger. Mm -hmm. And so also recognizing that we have to sometimes adapt our coping skills um, so that they can help us where we are, they can meet our needs now, and there's nothing wrong with that. And uh, one coping skill could work today, and um, tomorrow we might need it to, to be slightly different to have the same effect. And recognizing that that's okay, we just have to keep figuring out what coping skills work best for us. Yeah, absolutely. Overall, you never know what someone is going through and how much a single act of kindness could really help someone. When we help others, we also help ourselves. Our show is now coming to an end, but before we go, Dr. Smith, do you have any final advice for anyone currently struggling with mental health? Absolutely. Um, reach out for help. There's a lot of um, resources out there. NAMI or, uh, offers um, a lot of support groups. Um, there's a lot of therapists out there. You know, you don't have to be in this alone. Just figure out what tools you need in your toolbox um, to cope with whatever you're going on, what's ever going on with you. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for joining us today. We saw a glimpse into three unique stories about how people just like you and I cope with their mental health diagnoses through creativity. Talking about mental health needs to be normalized because opening up about one's feelings is the first step towards bettering oneself. We're all in this game of life together. If you or a loved one is struggling with a mental health crisis, please do not hesitate to reach out for help. You can access these local crisis resources by calling or texting.